This is the last in our series of videos on chemical kinetics. We're going to start out with a few quiz kin questions, and then we're going to move on to talking about mechanisms, which is the series of steps by which chemical reactions actually take place that explains their kinetics. So this first question is asking us, uh, for a first order reaction, where K is 0.12 per minute, at 20 degrees C, how long does it take for the concentration of the reactant to drop to 25% of what its original value was? So here's the relevant information. We know that K is equal to 0.12 per minutes. And we know that uh, we want to know how long it's going to take for the concentration to drop to 25% of its original value. So the concentration of A at time T, we could say, is the initial concentration divided by 4. Or we could say it's 0.25 times A0. Well, this is a first order reaction, and when you have a first order reaction, the natural log of A at any time is equal to minus KT plus the natural log of the initial concentration. What we're looking for is time here, so we'll solve this equation for time. Natural log of A at time T minus the natural log of initial concentration is equal to minus kt. So time would then be natural log of A at time t minus natural log of initial concentration divided by negative k. Or we could think about this as natural log of A at time t over concentration of A at time naught divided by negative k. So let's plug our numbers in here. This is natural log of initial concentration over 4 divided by initial concentration over minus 0.12 per minute. Well this works out to the natural log of 1 fourth over 1 divided by minus 0.12 per minute. And this comes out to 12 minutes. There's another way you can think about this. If this graph represents time versus concentration of reactant, we start out with the concentration of reactant being A0. And then we'll see a decrease in concentration that might look something like this. When the concentration has dropped to half of A0, well, that means one half-life has elapsed. Since half-lives are constant for first-order reactions, we could carry this further and say when the concentration has dropped to half of that, or A0 divided by 4, that would mean that two half-lives had elapsed. So if we can figure out what half-life is and double it, we know how much time has elapsed when the concentration has dropped to a fourth of its original value. So what's half-life? For a first-order reaction, half-life is equal to the natural log of 2 divided by k. So in this case, that's the natural log of 2 divided by 0.12 per minute. And that works out to 5.6 minutes. So if you take 5.6 minutes, which is one half-life, and double it, you get 12 minutes. Same answer we got the other way. So you can do it either way if it's a first order reaction. If this were zeroth or second order, you would not be able to do this because half-lives aren't constant. This question is for the first order reaction again with a K equal to 0.12 per minute. And now it's saying if the activation energy is 29 kilojoules, what is K at 30 degrees C? And instead of 29 kilojoules, this really should say 29 kilojoules per mole. Well, we can solve this problem using the Arrhenius equation, which says the natural log of K1 minus the natural log of K2 is equal to minus Ea over R times T2 minus T1 over T1 times T2. Natural log of one of the Ks is what we're looking for here, so let's just call it K1 that we're finding. It's easy to solve for it. 
natural log of K1 is equal to minus EA over R times T2 minus T1 over T1 times T2 plus natural log of K2. So now let's just put information in here. Natural log of K1 is equal to minus 29,000 joules per mole. That was 29 kilojoules per mole. That's EA divided by 8.314 joules per mole per Kelvin times T2 has to correspond with the 0.12 moles per liter minute and that was 293 kelvins. T1 has to correspond with our unknown K and that's going to be 303 kelvins. So we're dividing by 303 kelvins times 293 kelvins. And then we're adding to this the natural log of 0.12. And numbers become unitless when you take natural logs of them. So let's look at the units here. Joules per mole drop out. Uh, Kelvin squared will be in the denominator. And Kelvin squared will be in the numerator. So all units drop out. And this is going to leave us with a unitless number. So the natural log of K1 is just equal to 0.39 plus the natural log of 0.12 and that comes out to negative 1.73 so that means K1 is equal to E to the minus 1.73 and that comes out to 0.18 per minute so the rate constant has changed it's gotten larger which would mean the rate is going faster and that makes sense because the temperature has increased Here's another quiz again question. For a certain reaction, it says Ea is equal to 62 kilojoules per mole. And we're supposed to calculate the ratio of rate constants at 50 degrees C to 0 degrees C. So in kelvins, this would be 273 kelvins. And 50 degrees C would be 323 kelvins. The Arrhenius equation should be the right way to solve this. Natural log of K1 over K2. That's actually what we're looking for is that ratio is equal to minus EA over R times T2 minus T1 over T1 times T2. Let's say that K1 is the one at 50 degrees C, which is 323 kelvins. And so that means K2 is the rate constant at 0 degrees C, so that's in the denominator, and so that would be the 273 kelvin temperature. So, natural log of K1 divided by K2 is equal to Ea, negative Ea, and that's minus 62,000 in joules per mole to make that work out with R, which is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin times T2 is 273 Kelvins minus T1, which is 323 Kelvins, divided by 323 kelvins times 273 kelvins. We've seen before that the units all drop out of here, and this becomes unitless. And the numerical answer is 4.23. So that means natural log of this ratio that we're interested in finding, K1 over K2, is equal to 4.23. So the ratio itself, the ratio of K1 to K2, is equal to E to the 4.23. And that turns out to 69. So what this means is the rate constant is 60 time, 69 times bigger when the temperature goes from 0 up to 50 degrees C. This quiz is asking, it looks like the same reaction. And Ea is 62 kilojoules per mole. What's the temperature at which K is 0 0.025 per second if K is 0 0.05 per second at 25 degrees C? Now we can sort of pre-analyze our answer here. We're looking for the temperature at which K is smaller, so that means a lower rate. So that should mean that our answer will be a lower temperature than 25 degrees C. Let's see if it works out that way. Start out with the natural log of K1 over K2 equals minus Ea over R times T2 minus T1 over T1, T2, the Arrhenius equation. Let's call K1 
the 0 0.025 per second and so T1 is our unknown and K2 is the 0 0.050 per second and T2 then is 25 degrees C which is 298 in kelvins. So the natural log of K1 over K2 times R times T2 divided by minus EA would be equal to T2 minus T1 over T1. And I could continue to solve this algebraically for T1, but I think that's going to get pretty messy. So I'm going to throw numbers in here at this point. So natural log of K1 is 0 0.025 over 0 0.050, because that's K2, times 8.314 joules per mole per Kelvin times T2, which is 298 kelvins, all divided by a negative 62,000 joules per mole is going to be equal to 298 kelvins minus T1 divided by T1. So evaluating all this stuff on the left-hand side, units are going to end up being unit less, and when I do all the arithmetic, I end up with 0 0.0276 equals 298 kelvins minus T1 over T1. So I'll multiply both sides by T1 and then divide both sides by 0 0.0276, and I'll get this expression. T1 is equal to 298 kelvins minus T1 over 0 0.0276, which works out to... 10,800 kelvins minus 36.2 times T1. So I'll continue my work up here. I'll add 36.2 to both sides, which gives me 37.2 T1 is equal to 10,800 kelvins. So T1 is 10,800 kelvins divided by 37.2 and that works out to 290 kelvins, which is 17 degrees C. So our expectation that we would get a smaller temperature when the rate constant was lower turns out to be true. Lots of reactions happen in a series of simpler steps that are called elementary processes. And there are lots of cases where you would think this would have to happen. Like, for example, if I have a plus B plus C, three reactants forming a product, D I'm going to call it. This would require a simultaneous three-way collision with proper orientation and sufficient kinetic energy. And so you'd think this would be a pretty slow reaction. So if this reaction happens at a fast rate, well, this clearly isn't exactly how it happens. It could be something like this. A plus B makes something called E, maybe and then E reacts with C, and that makes D. And so maybe this is very slow because of the required three-way collision, and maybe this is faster, and maybe this is much faster, and when you sum these up, E drops out, and it ends up overall being A plus B plus C makes D, but the result is a lot faster reaction if it happens in two steps. So each one of these steps is what's called an elementary process. And the whole sequence of steps is what's called a reaction mechanism. For elementary processes, for these simple steps, there turns out to be a relationship between the balanced equation, the coefficients in the balanced equation, and the rate law for the step. Let's look at a mechanism where 2NO2 makes NO3 and NO, and then that NO3 that's been produced reacts with CO to make NO2 and CO2. When you sum this up, you get the overall reaction, which is that NO2 plus CO makes NO and CO2, because the NO3 cancels out of both sides. And one of the NO2s does as well. So when you sum these up, you get the overall reaction here. Now, let's take a look at what the rate laws might be by just thinking about collision theory. For this step here, I've got NO3 colliding with CO. Let's try to build a rate law just using common sense. Rate is equal to K times K1 
concentration of NO3 to the something, we don't know what yet, times concentration of CO to the something else. What would happen if I doubled the concentration of NO3? What would make sense? In this simple process, doubling the concentration of NO3, since there are only two things to collide with each other, <clears throat> it should make it twice as likely for any given CO to collide with an NO3. If that's the case, I would expect to see the rate doubled. So it must be first order in NO3. If I think about the concentration of NO3 staying the same, and I double the concentration of CO, well, in a very simple step like this, all I'm doing is making it twice as likely for any given NO3 to contact the CO. So doubling the concentration of CO should also double the rate. So it would be first order in CO also. Let's look at the other elementary process, the first step. Rate equals K times concentration of NO2 to the something, we don't know. Well, really what this reaction would be written as is NO2 plus NO2. If I double the concentration of NO2, two things happen. I have twice as many NO2s that have twice as great a chance of contacting any other NO2, because really I've doubled both reactants, because it's the same reactant. So doubling the concentration of NO2 should cause my rate to go up by not double, but four times. So the coefficient in the rate law should be a 2. Now, what we've done here is uncovered a general principle that would work for all simple steps, all elementary processes. The coefficients are the rate exponents. A 2 in front of NO2 means a 2 as an exponent, second order. A 1 in front of NO3 in this step and a 1 in front of CO in that step means first order in both of those reactants here. So for elementary processes, and this is not true for overall reactions, not every reaction obeys this, but these simple steps that are part of a mechanism for elementary processes, the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation are the exponents in the rate law. We can evaluate reaction mechanisms. We can predict whether they're likely to explain the kinetics of a reaction using what we know about collision theory and a known experimental rate law. Here's an example. In this reaction where two NO2 Cl's make two NO2's and a Cl2, we know that it's first order by experiment. Doing experiments show us that it's first order in NO2Cl. The question is, could this reaction possibly occur in a single step? Well, if it was a single step reaction, then that would be an elementary process. And what would the rate law be? Well, from what we've just seen, the rate would have to be equal to K times NO2Cl raised to whatever the coefficient is on NO2Cl, and that would be 2. That would make it a second order reaction in NO2Cl. And experimentally, we see that it's not. It's a first order reaction. So no, this thing can't occur in a single step. It's not possible. Could this mechanism explain the reaction kinetics? Well, you have to answer two questions. First of all, when you add them up, do you get the overall reaction? Let's see. If I sum these up, the Cl atom is going to cancel out, and I'll end up with 2NO2Cl forming NO2 plus NO2, so that's 2NO2 plus a Cl2. And that was the overall reaction. So in terms of just adding the steps up, that works. The other thing that we have to explain is, does the rate law of the step that would determine the rate, it's called the rate determining step, match the experimental rate law? Well, if this is an elementary process here, the first one, rate would be equal to K times NO2Cl raised to the coefficient of NO2Cl in the balanced step, and that would be a 1. For this one, rate would be equal to K times NO2Cl times Cl raised, both raised to the 1 power. Well, which step is going to determine the rate of this reaction? I can't do the second step until I create some Cl. 
So the rate determining step, rate determining step, is going to be the first step in this process. So its rate law is the rate law for the reaction, and that is first order in NO2Cl. That matches the experimental data, and so this is a good candidate. It's probable that this mechanism explains how that reaction occurs. Here's another one. For this reaction, where 2NO react with 2H2 to make nitrogen, N2, and two waters. The experimental rate law is rate is K times NO squared times H2 to the 1 power. Clearly, this does not happen in a single step, or it would have to be second order in H2. So it's not an elementary process itself. Let's look at two mechanisms and see if they're likely candidates. Is this a possible mechanism? Well, let's first of all sum up the two steps and see if they give the overall reaction. I'll cancel N2O from both sides. 2NO plus 2H2 gives N2 plus H2O and H2O, 2H2O. That was the overall reaction, so that test is good. Now, did the kinetics of this process explain the kinetics we see from experiment? Well, the slow step is going to be the rate determining step. You can't do the second step until you've created N2O, and that process is very slow. The rate law for this step determines the rate law for the equation. Treating it as an elementary process, here's what we get. Rate is equal to K times concentration of NO raised to its coefficient, which is 2, times concentration of H2 raised to its coefficient, which is 1. That is the experimental rate law. So this does explain, theoretically, how that reaction could be second order in NO and first order in H2. However, if I look at the mechanics of this, there is a three-way collision here. Two NOs and an H2 have to all collide with the proper orientation and proper kinetic energy for this to happen. That would be a pretty slow step, and it's probably unlikely. Actual reaction rates, we don't know what they are. We just know what the rate law is. They would probably be faster than would be predicted by this three-way collision. Let's try another mechanism. This is a three-step process. We have a fast step, a slow step, and another fast step. First of all, let's find out if they even work. Let's sum them up. N2O2 is produced and then used up, so I cancel that. N2O is produced in the second step and used in the third, so I cancel that out. When I sum it up, I have 2NO plus 2H2s makes N2 plus 2H2O. So they do add up. That's correct. Now, what's going to be the rate determining step? Well, the first step is going to happen fast and it produces N2O2, which is needed for the second step. So you can't do the second step until the first step is done. However, you can't do the third step until the second step has done, and that's slow. So the rate determining step is going to be the second step in this process. What's the rate law for that step? Well, rate here would have to be equal to K times N2O2 times H2. And they would both be raised to the first power because that's what their coefficients are. Now, I don't really know if this matches the experimental rate law because the experimental rate law was rate equals K times NO squared times H2 to the 1. And N2O2 isn't in the overall reaction. It's an intermediate. And so I can't judge whether the rate law for this step matches the experimental rate law. So I'm going to have to do a trick here. Okay, here's our mechanism. <clears throat> this is the rate determining step, and we've determined that its rate law is rate <clears throat> equals K times concentration of N2O2 times concentration of H2, because it's an elementary process. The exponents are equal to the coefficients. But the overall reaction has this rate law. Rate <clears throat> is equal to K times concentration of NO squared times concentration of H2. Somehow we need to find out if this rate law is the same as this rate law. Now this might seem like a really obscure thing to do, what I'm about to 
accomplished, but it shows up in the AP chemistry exam pretty routinely. And so you want to learn how to do this justification. Here's how it works. What I'm basically going to do is I'm going to substitute something for N2O2 that sort of translates it into the language of the overall reaction. Here's how it works. It uses the fact that that first fast step is a reversible reaction. So looking only at the first step here, we're going to write two rate laws, one for the forward reaction and one for the reverse reaction. So forward. The way it's written forward, the rate, if this is an elementary process, the rate would have to be equal to K times concentration of NO squared. But I'm going to put KF for forward to distinguish it from the reverse reaction. Now, looking at the reverse rate is equal to K reverse times concentration of N2O2 to the 1 power. Because these are at equilibrium, they're going forward and backward at the same rate. That's the definition of equilibrium. So I could say this. Kf times concentration of NO squared is equal to Kr times concentration of N2O2 to the 1 power. Now what I want to do is substitute something for N2O2 that puts it in terms of NO. I can do that by solving this equation for concentration of N2O2. I'll do that by dividing both sides by Kr. So concentration of N2O2 is equal to Kf divided by Kr times concentration of NO squared. So wherever I see concentration of N2O2, like right here, I could substitute for Kf over Kr times concentration of NO squared. So let's do that. Into the rate law for the slow step, <clears throat> which is rate equals K times N2O2 concentration times H2 concentration, I'm going to substitute in this stuff. So Kf over Kr times concentration of NO squared, and then that was originally times concentration of H2. So this is another way of writing the rate law for the slow step. Now K times Kf over Kr is just a combination of Ks, so it's like another K. So I could rewrite this and say rate is equal to a different K, I'll just call it K primed, times concentration of NO squared times concentration of H2. And that is the experimental rate law. So in fact, this mechanism does explain the kinetics of the reaction. I don't have any three-way collisions. All the collisions are likely to occur at fairly rapid rates. And the rate determining step does, if you do this little trick, match the experimental rate law. The last thing I want to talk about is a little bit more detail about catalysts. Catalysts provide a lower energy reaction pathway that's an alternative to the normal way of doing it. So if you look at an uh, energy diagram like we saw before, the uncatalyzed pathway has an Ea that's that high. The catalyzed pathway, the only difference is that it just lowers the energy hill. The delta H here, or delta E, is the same. The difference between reactants and products are the same. There's no difference in the actual thermal chemistry of the reaction. But because the energy hill is lower, it's easier for the reaction to get started. And that means you're going to have more particles that will have enough kinetic energy to react at a given temperature when it's catalyzed than if it wasn't catalyzed. And so the reaction rate increases with a catalyst present. On a frequency diagram, this is what it looks like. The frequency profiles are the same because it's the same temperature in both of these graphs. What's different is where is the boundary, where's the cutoff for Ea? Ea is high in the uncatalyzed reaction, and so you only have a limited number of particles that have sufficient kinetic energy. But with Ea lower on the energy graph, you have a much larger area under the curve that represents particles that have enough Ke to react, so the rate increases. 
there are two kinds of catalysts. Catalysts work in two different ways. One is homogeneous catalysts. Homogeneous catalysts exist in the same phase as the reactants do, and it's almost like they're a participant, like a reactant or product, except they aren't. An example would be the demonstration where hydrogen peroxide decomposition occurred. Here's the overall reaction. H2O2 decomposes to water and oxygen gas, and this is extremely slow. It takes forever for it to happen. But if you add iodide solution, a homogeneous catalysis occurs. Here's what happens. If iodide is present, it's going to react with the H2O2, and it's going to produce water and hypoiodite. That hypoiodite then reacts with a second H2O2, and that produces iodide and water and O2. <clears throat> well, this is fast, and this is also fast. So the reaction goes much more quickly than it would otherwise. And when you add it up, the catalyst, which is the I, cancels out, and the intermediate, the hypoiodite that's formed, also cancels out. And when you add it all up, you have the overall reaction. 2H2O2 makes 2H2O and NO2. And the net result is that the whole thing is faster. Here's another one. In commercially producing H2SO4, <clears throat> this is a reaction mechanism by which H2SO4 could be formed. But it's slow because that second step is really slow. So you take sulfur, oxidize it to make SO2, oxidize the SO2 to make SO3, and then react the SO3 with water, and it makes H2SO4. If you add NO2 to the reaction mixture, that changes everything. Once the SO2 is created, then another step occurs. SO2 reacts with NO2, and it produces NO and SO3. Now, instead of being slow, like the SO2 plus oxygen makes SO3, this is pretty fast. Then, the next thing that happens is that NO reacts with oxygen, and it produces NO2. And that's also fast. So instead of step two, these two steps occur. What's the end result? The NO2 that I added as a catalyst disappears. It nets out of the equation. So does the intermediate that got created, NO. And when I add these two steps up, I just get SO2 plus one-half O2 makes SO3. It's the same thing as step number two, except instead of being slow, it's too fast. And so the reaction happens much more rapidly. And that's commercially very important because H2SO4 is the chemical that is most often sold by chemical manufacturing firms. So this catalysis happens a lot. The other kind of a catalyst is called a heterogeneous catalyst. And heterogeneous catalysts the catalyst actually exists in a separate phase from the reactants, and it's not a participant. It's not part of the chemical reaction. It's just a place. It's a substrate for the reactants to meet. This often happens with metal surfaces. Metal surfaces can hold particles in place, and it makes the collisions more likely. So, for example, if this molecule, whatever it is, this purple-green molecule, has to react with these red atoms to produce a product over here, it would be difficult for these things to meet in three-dimensional space. If they're bouncing around in three dimensions, they have three ways of missing each other. They can miss each other by being too far from the right or left, too far up or down, or they could be too far away from one another when they stop moving, when they bounce off the wall. So they have three dimensions, three ways that they can miss each other. Once they stick to this metal surface, they only have two ways that they can miss each other. They can miss each other in this direction and in this direction, but they can no longer miss each other in this direction because they're both stuck to the same surface. So that speeds up the likelihood of finding uh, another particle to react with, and the reaction goes more rapidly. 
The catalytic converter in a car does this to reduce carbon monoxide and nitrogen monoxide emissions. The reaction between carbon monoxide and nitrogen monoxide to make CO2 and N2, it's actually balanced with twos here and here, that goes too slow to react very much of the reactants as the exhaust passes through a normal exhaust pipe. But since about the 1970s, cars have now catalytic converters in there, which have a platinum substrate for the particles to stick to. That means that they're likely to find each other, and that means that the rate of reaction goes up, and so that means we have much lower levels of carbon monoxide and nitrogen monoxide in our atmosphere coming out of car tailpipes. So that's a practical example of a heterogeneous catalyst.